Cool. I think we're good. Brilliant. Thank Very you. Great. Hi everyone. Um, I decided to pick a very complicated topic um, and I've gone for analgesia. I'm currently on my surgery portion of my rotation. So I thought this was quite fitting to surgery and I'm mostly focusing on operative analgesia and post-operative analgesia. So very, very, very quickly in a lot of words, um, to really understand what analgesics are, you need to understand pain and the difference between pain, nociception and analgesia. So pain is the perception of something that might be potential or actual tissue damage. So it's both sensory and emotional. Um, nociception is actually the physiological process that results in the conscious perception of pain. So that's the way that you get to it. Analgesia is taking away um, the stimuli or taking away the pain, sorry, in the presence of stimuli that would normally be painful. And the analgesics are the things that produce the analgesia, if that makes sense. So as I said, I, uh, I picked this and then I did a lot of research into it to try and do a 20, 30 minute talk. And um, analgesia is very long and very complicated, um, in particular, because a lot of it overlaps with anesthetics um, as a different way of controlling nociception. Um, so I've decided to just focus on some of the main analgesic classes, how they work and what their indications are and reasons that we don't give it or side effects that we're looking for. Um, so as per this little dog is showing us, the main kind of ones that we're focusing on are opioids, non-steroidals, NMDA antagonists such as ketamine, um, alpha-2 agonists such as metatomidine, um, and I didn't end up going into local anesthetics because it got very complicated and way longer than half an hour. So I thought we'd start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, so basically I think of non-steroidals as the three A's. It produces anti-inflammation, it's an analgesic, and it's an antipyretic. So inflammation being wound pain, you have swelling, you have heat, you have all those things. And so by addressing inflammation, you address wound pain. Um, and as a result with the analgesia, they're not quite as good as opioids. They don't cause sedation and they're not so great for gut pain. It's more a focus on musculoskeletal pain. So this was a really simple diagram that I did not do. Um, basically, if you think of the way that anti-inflammatories work, it's through something called a COX-mediated prostaglandin formation. So COX is a pathway that helps produce prostaglandins. There's kind of two lots of prostaglandins. One's COX-1, which is kind of what we think of as the household necessary prostaglandins. And one's COX-2, which is inflammatory prost prostaglandins. So when you kind of go down these pathways, I mean, they do overlap a lot and there's a lot of debate. The COX-2 ones are the ones that produce inflammation and pain. So when you've got cell damage, you see this COX pathway occurs, we create prost prostaglandins and then you get the pain and inflammation. The non act on that COX pathway so that fewer prostaglandins are produced. Because there's two pathways, it can actually also impact COX-1 and not just COX-2, which is why we kind of get to the side effects and the other things that you need to think about. So there are quite a few side effects, uh, as you know, um, gastrointestinal, diarrhea, vomiting, um, mucosal damage uh, and things like that. The way um, renal disease kind of works and the way that you think about how non-steroidals could impact renal disease is the biggest thing is to focus on um, anything that impacts the amount of blood volume that's going through your body. So trauma and blood loss, dehydration, heart failure, decreased blood pressure, anything that stops the blood volume that's going through is going to impact the kidney's function when you then put in something on top like a non-steroidal. So we need to be really careful when using it with acute pain management intraoperatively that we don't give these non-steroidals and then perpetuate whatever the blood volumes do. So we've got to take a lot of caution with that. And of course, if there's already underlying kidney disease, that's going to be an extra factor as to why to be careful with non-steroidals. Um, the other thing it impacts is primary clot formation and also it can have hepatic toxicosis. Um, and pretty much, yeah, the big thing is making sure that we are using it post-operatively when it comes to surgery, um, because we want to make sure that there's adequate circulation when we're using it. Um, so indications. So otherwise healthy animals, musculoskeletal pain, um, so post-operative pain, 
there is it is used a lot for quality of life chronic pain control with arthritis um, although it's not really surgery that's another reason that we use it uh, and then the main kind of three ones that we use a lot and you hear of a lot is meloxicam and so that works mostly on the cox2 pathway whereas carprofen is not se selective and it acts on both the pathways um, but it does seem to have more impact on cox2 than cox1 and then furacoxib which is previcox is um, cox2 selective so then I did a bit of research into galloprant um, because we have kind of heard that word thrown around a lot, but it's not a common non-steroidal that we use. And the way that that works is it doesn't actually block that COX pathway, but it seems to actually block further down at the specific prostaglandin. So I don't know if I can go back, but if you think of it here, if you've got your cell damage, COX pathway creates prostaglandins, the galloprant acts here so that fewer prostaglandins can actually control can, contribute to pain and inflammation. Um, so that's the newer option. Um, then we've got opioids. So opioids are a big one that we use a lot of. Um, you've got opioid receptors all through your nervous system, from your central nervous system, your spine, and in the peripheral tissues. Um, so the way it works is that they activate the opioid receptors. That means that there's less neurotransmitters that are produced. Um, and therefore there's inhibition of neuro, uh, nociception, which as we know means that they have less degree of pain. So the benefit of activating these opioid receptors is that you get analgesia, but then the added benefit that we like in surgery is that it often also causes sedation. The sedative effects of opioids are much more um, reliable in dogs than in cats which is another reason amongst many that we would use multiple sedatives preoperatively because they kind of have synergistic effects. So the things to be aware of with opioids and things to be concerned about are the less desirable effects. Um, so you can see respiratory depression. It's not so common in um, dogs and cats compared to people apparently, um, but it is something that we need to be aware of when we're giving it under a general anesthetic. Um, gastrointestinal side effects such as vomiting um, and hypermotility and then the cardiovascular side effects such as bradycardia which we had recently in Jack um, when he was on a high dose of fentanyl we saw those side effects. So if we I kind of just try to focus on the main opioids that we use so the two main um, there's many many opioid receptors but the two ones that we talk about are mu and kappa so mu agonists are such as methadone and fentanyl. Um, and then we've got the kappa agonists, which is butorphanol. Buprenorphine is a partial mu agonist. Um, and then we've got the mu antagonists. So the ones that reverse the effects of the agonists. So naloxone we know of so quickly and we jump to if they've had a reaction to methadone. But butorphanol is not only a kappa agonist, but it's also a um, mu antagonist. So it gets really complicated when you try and think about potency, um, efficacy for pain relief and how affinitive they are for the receptors because of which ones actually bind better to what receptors. So agonists that have a higher affinity for a certain receptor can actually block the action of a different agonist with a lesser affinity. So compared to all these different levels. Now, if you look at potency, potency is actually impacted by both its affinity for the receptor and also its ability to cause pain relief at the site. So fentanyl, for example, um, is 100 times more potent than methadone and buprenorphine is 30 times more potent than methadone. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is better pain relief than methadone. It just means if you combine these factors, you've got to think about when the moral of the story being is that when you're using different opioids, it can get really complicated and you can have unreliable analgesia, um, which is why we always think about when we're starting Fent, when we're stopping methadone and things like that. Just to clarify for those who might know, when we talk about affinity, it's how well a drug binds to that receptor. So if something's got really good affinity, it really wants to bind to that receptor and do something. If it's got poor affinity, it doesn't really bind very well. Shoved off by something that's like super key. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I kind of didn't, again, I didn't make this. I, I found this. So this is um, like a 
quick sedation, um, analgesia, duration action, and indication of these really common ones that we use, um, which I thought, again, a lot of the time we're talking about the level of surgery that's going on. So what about the others? These aren't the only opioids that we use, um, and we talk a lot about oral and take-home opioids. So we use a lot of transdermal fentanyl here, which has uh, got, to sh got some good effects compared to others, but you've got to think about how vasoconstriction and vasodilation will actually impact how quickly this is up taken up by the body and at what rate. Um, so there's quite a range in time to plasma levels depending on the patient. So we've got 12 hours in cats that it takes from putting it on to actually being in the body, um, 20 hours in dogs, and the duration in cats can be up to five days where it's more three days in dogs. Um, but there's actually quite a good evidence behind this transdermal fentanyl patch um, compared to others. Buccal buprenorphine has good bioavailability bio for cats. So it means that it's absorbed quite well when popped in those mucous membranes. Um, and it actually provides relatively predictable pain relief for cats. There's a bit of debate about oral tramadol. It does cause mild to moderate pain relief in um, people, but in dogs, the studies, I couldn't really find anything that really proves how effective tramadol is. Um, and so it's suspect, suspected that it's actually poorly effective because its bio, bioavailability isn't very good. So it's not actually well absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract. The similar situation with codeine, it's not really well documented how well it works. Theoretically, because in people it provides good analgesia, but where there is concern about the bioavailability. Um, it also has side effects like sedation and dysphoria, which makes it very hard to, for clients to assess, oh, is my dog actually more comfortable or is he just sedated? Um, it is a good, reliable cough suppressant. So we do still use it a lot for that. Um, alpha-2 agonists are the other one that we're going to touch on. So the main one that we use is metatomidine. Alpha-2 agonists, we reach for a lot because we use it as sedation, but it actually does provide um, analgesia as well. And it works really well with opioids. So they have synergistic effects on each other. So they, you get good analgesia. Um, we've got these alpha-2 receptors also in the nervous system, and these activate these alpha-2 receptors. Um, the things to be careful of as well are the side effects. So we've got bradycardia is the main one. Um, initially, we see hypertension, but that can actually be followed by hypotension and sedation, which we often why we're giving it. But if we're using it for pain relief properties alone, we need to think of those things as well. Um, ketamine is a great drug. Um, so it's mostly used as a dissociative anesthetic, but it actually does have good analgesic properties. And the analgesic properties that it has is at sub anesthetic doses. So at lower doses than what you need to induce anesthesia, you can actually see that pain relief. Um, it also causes sedation, which is really great for our pain, painful dogs. So it gets really complicated uh, about how this pain relief works. But if you kind of think about, you've got your, um, neurological system and where the pathways are passed through, it's through something called the dorsal horn. So what happens is that when you're painful, it keeps telling the dorsal horn that you're painful and you create like, as I figuratively see a wind up um, so that the body kind of is just being pumped again and again about it. So we've got um, like the NMDA receptors um, in this pathway, this is an antagonist of this. So it blocks that NMDA receptor and helps prevent that dorsal horn wind up. Um, it's really short acting. So that's why we often put it in CRIs and it's analgesia effects again are best when given with opioids and other things. Side effects is it stimulates the cardiac output and blood pressure. It's also a respiratory depressant. Um, it can cause skeletal muscle hypertonicity. So like twitching. Um, and then behavioral changes, which we all know very well. Um, I decided to touch on gabapentin because we do use it a lot post-operatively um, and overall. There was a lot of debate. Um, I found a review article on someone who's looked at all the articles that were released since 2018 to 2020 on gabapentin. Um, and it seems to have some study support analgesia and some don't. 
it seems that post-operatively it doesn't have a lot of strong evidence, but with chronic neuropathic pain, there is evidence for it, but it's still quite limited information. With people, they do use it for the management of neuropathic pain. Um, there's studies supporting uh, anxiolytic effects, which we often use it for. So they don't, we're not really sure how gabapentin works <coughs> in dogs and cats, um, but we think again, it works at this dorsal horn and helps reduce the release of these excitatory neurotransmitters. Um, and it works on the dorsal horn and MDA receptors. Um, the side effects, as we all know, sedation and ataxia. In people, they've reported hepatic toxicity. So I guess the conclusion that we kind of make from this is that it's a good adjunctive therapy, but on its own, we can't say that it reliably provides pain relief at home, particularly post-operatively. Paracetamol is an interesting one because it's one that we reach for a lot that clients are really scared of. Um, and I feel like almost every time I dispense this, I have to have a conversation of, yes, I know that it's toxic to dogs, but actually we do use it. The main reason that we really push with clients, like in just general information that paracetamol is toxic is that it's got a really low therapeutic margin. So it doesn't take much to overdose it. So it's just a lot easier to say to clients, don't give paracetamol unless you've been prescribed it. I once saw a Pomeranian um, who was lame on its leg. I think it had MPL or something like that. And the owners went, oh, when my leg's sore, I give two paracetamol. So they gave their Pomeranian two paracetamol and its liver was absolutely cooked. Um, the owner refused any treatment, took the dog home, let it hide under its bed for like days. And then it just somehow survived, uh, which was great for the dog, but also I spent the whole time telling the owner, your dog's gonna die. And it just hid, and it just hid under a bed for a few days. Um, <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> it's those ones. So great, the dog survived. So it causes liver damage, um, met hemoglobinemia. Did I say that right? I find that one hard. And dry eye. Um, and you've got to be careful with severe hepatic or renal impairment. Um, and dogs only, it's really, really toxic to cats at any level. So how paracetamol works, we actually don't really know, not even in people. Um, it seems to have good control of mild to moderate pain and it's also an antipyritic. Um, it doesn't really have the good anti-inflammatory effects. So if you're using it in, instead of non-steroidals, you've got to be aware of the fact that the anti-inflammatory effects aren't there, but it does have fewer gastrointestinal side effects. Um, and it also comes as an IV formulation. So it can be a good post-operative pain relief to use as long as we're being aware that there's no anti-inflammatory going on. Now, there were a few kind of um, drugs out there that we use where there's this debate as to whether it works or not. Gabapentin being a common one that we use and meropotent, I also find we use a lot and we're using it a lot mostly for amesis, but we also go, oh yes, there's good visceral pain relief. Um, which I remember reading in an article when I was a new grad, just planting in the back of my mind and then not really thinking about it again. Uh, so I did a bit of diving into moropotent and whether it is actually good pain relief. So the way it works is it works on a, sub, a substance called substance P, which again is part of that dorsal horn area in the um, neuro pathway. So Substance P causes vomiting, it causes inflammation, and also causes nociception processing. Now, moropotin actually works as a antagonist to inhibit the binding of substance P in the emetic center of the brain, so where we vomit. So as a result, it's an anti-emetic and an anti tussive because the centers are very close. So there's actually little evidence on how well it works for pain and inflammation, and there's no real proven clear effect but it seems that because it's binding with substance well it inhibits the binding of substance p that hopefully along those same pathways is why we also get um decreased nociception so that's just really touching on it um we've got a lot of options when it comes to analgesia this was off clinician's brief um and it's just kind of got like a good little surgery thing you probably, probably can't see it it's like really tiny Basically, it's going through dogs, mild pain surgery, what your in-hospital options are, post-op options are, moderate pain, severe pain. Of course, here we do a lot of the severe pain ones um, and what kind of medications we should be considering um, for the different patients, but there's a lot more to learn. Uh, the main kind of focus being, again, on analgesic um, 
options when it comes to anesthesia as well, local anesthetics and things like that. Um, so there's still a lot more out there. Uh, <laughs> um, when you spoke about the fentanyl, um, the intradermal dermal fentanyl um, taking up to 20 hours to like reach the plasma, is that suggesting that we should either place the fentanyl patches on earlier or give them analgesia if they go viral to the same day that it's placed on? That's a very fair point. And yeah, absolutely. If we're seeing that the general consensus was 12 hours for cats, that probably goes quite well because you probably think about in the morning at rounds you place it on and the animal goes home at six yeah. but when it comes to dogs it might actually not really kick in until the early hours of the morning so should we be giving something in the meantime again the hard thing is is that with the potency of different opioids um whether like as this was saying the how the affinity if it binds and then the other one binds better um yeah but um Oh, yeah, fix up the next one. Yeah. Um, did you look into like oral bioavailability with buprenorphine in dogs? Because I've heard a few like mixed things. Like, I used to work with a vet who was like, no, no, like, there's studies now that show that like you can definitely use it orally in dogs. I guess the thing is, it's just. Like, I couldn't just find it. anything. Almost all of it was in cats, and there was just saying there's no real proof about the bioavailability in dogs. Yeah, right. So I think there's a too little information to say from what from what I could find, too little information. But it seemed to be quite strong in cats that it's predictable in terms of the pain relief. I don't think it is. And it, it is hard, I find, when these ones that cause sedation, like I've had plenty of clients who I've sent home on coding where they're like, yeah, this was the best one. And you go, is your dog just karma? Same with gabapentin, things like that. Um, but I guess part of that does come down for pain relief. I know if I'm in pain, I'd rather feel karma. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's it's part of the whole debate of pain being not just physical but also emotional trauma and that's like in the definition i got out of those definitions were from veterinary giant textbooks on analgesia and anesthetics and it, the definition even in pets is that it's an emotional pain response which is also why pain relief and sedation are so good and important from the start of their visit um because we don't want to emotionally trauma we like to do that. Oh, no, you do. So I did yeah. think of that what as one. On that? I did think that of that as one, and I did start looking into it, and then it got incredibly complicated in the anesthetics part, and I had about six slides on analgies, uh, sorry, anesthetics and local anesthetics alone. Um, I think from what I could tell before I kind of gave up on that idea of in this talk is that it does provide some pain relief because it also impacts on the nociception pathway but the side effects such as nausea and motility really impact whether or not it's indicated in gastrointestinal surgeries um, but local anesthetics definitely have their place for providing pain relief particularly if we are doing them like with what carissa and clorinda and everyone do with the knees yeah so yes, absolutely. I can do that as my next talk, local anesthetics. <laughs> the lidocaine in a, as an adjunct yeah. to being asleep works really well for, with every what with the other drugs that you've got in combination, like your opioids. It helps a lot mm. in the edgy scenes, visceral pain. Patients. Yeah. So like I probably wouldn't use it as much, say in a tea yellow or something like that. But that visceral like abdominal pain or even thoracic pain patient that they it can make a difference it just kind of smooths out the analgesia and makes them can make them a little more comfortable but like alex said they can get super nauseous on high dose um so basically anything over 50 points per, feet per minute they tend to get start to think about being nauseous so you just gotta be careful. But, but we would use lower doses for analgesia versus anti -movement. Yeah, so, but some of the anesthetists use oh, much higher doses than what yeah. I and I was like, hey, like I would use like 30 to maybe 50 mics per kilo per minute to, as an adjunct analgesia. But I think Keely will go up to 
100 point a kilo per minute. And I'm like, oh, that's really good. That's super high. Territory. <laughs> territory, so yeah. And I guess the moral of the story is that all of this is about adjunct therapy yeah. and adding things in and better to have like a balance of lots of little ones than giving just five mics of fentanyl um, and then having those side effects, adding in ketamine and lignocaine and things like that. Cool. Thanks. 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 Danielle, is that working? Yep, you can see it. Great, go for it. Jess. All right, Jess, our medicine intern's up next. You probably might just have to click that to move through your slides rather than the keyboard. Okay, you just press um, that one to go through. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully it'll open. I'll just come back out if not. We'll see. Um, hi, guys. Um, so I started to do a talk on meningitis and then realised how complicated and big it was. Um, so I'm going to give you a general overview as it's a topic that we've seen quite frequently in the clinic as of late in the medicine department um, and the, how it presents can be quite confronting um, in some situations, particularly for owners. Um, but I'm going to focus on one of the most common um, subtypes of meningitis known as SRMA, which is a steroid responsive meningitis arteriosis. Um, and I'll go through all the definitions um, and then hone back in on SRMA for you guys. Um, just had a little break. Oh, you, you. <laughs> no, I don't think it does. <laughs> Park it. Is it working? It's not, it's not coming up on the screen. I don't think it's going to work. I think well, I can, my guy, put it on now. Yeah. I can just do it for the people in the house. <laughs> it's got to be an in person experience. Yeah. The benefits of turning up to my long conversations. Yeah. <laughs> this went for a lot longer than I was hoping it went for. <laughs> Make it be worse. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> It's all right, Liz. I'm really, no, I just like we've looked it up now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a last minute addition to the slideshow. I'm, I'm almost there, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, Eugene's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> it's not surgery, <laughs> so it's okay. Did you see it? Yeah. Oh, he's got an ad. Skipping the ad. Oh, is that an omen for my show? <laughs> <laughs> it's going down. All right. Are you playing it at both times? No, I think I'm just going to do it. Do you have down? I will. Sorry, guys. We're just going to. Sorry for those at home. Liz, if you want to put that link into the chat, I'll see if I can bring it up on my computer and share it. No. no. Um, okay. 
It's not that good. I'm really sorry, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Remember the thing. Um, Am I doing it? Am I doing it? The problem. Oh God. Can I just do it for the in-house one? Yeah. Uh, Liz, can you see the I don't think you it's see your work. sharing option? It's really I think not you're working. testing my it's technological like a, it's like a two second thing. <laughs> we just need to sing, let's get physical. Is that no? One? No, okay. <laughs> This is literally the worst way. Like, <laughs> I feel like, can we, we'll just do it for the people in the clinic, Danielle off my laptop and go back to the PowerPoint slide on the Zoom. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine with me. All right, okay. just hold in there, be 20 seconds. <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but moving forward, whenever you see Jess in the clinic, you really need to sing that to her. <laughs> All right, right. Danielle, I think we're back to the PowerPoint now. Can you guys see it? Danny? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Are you, can you guys see everything? Great. Yep. And okay, so just starting with some terminology that we we're going to hit on throughout the presentation um, so we're talking about the central nervous system in this presentation and we have the brain the spinal cord um, and a protective cover over that known as the meninges and um, so we usually use inflammatory cns disease to describe a number of conditions that cause inflammation of these structures so depending on which part of the CNS is involved, um, we can divide it into meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges, um, encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, or myelitis, inflammation of the spinal cord. Usually we have a combination of both, considering they're all um, in contact with each other, we can get spread from the spinal cord brain or to the meninges, vice versa. Um, for those of you did, that don't know what the meninges are, it's this three layer structure that covers, so we have our bone, um, which could be like our cranium, and then we have three layers, which make up the meninges, um, and then this is our spinal cord, but essentially we have the brain under that as well. So it's just this protective layering, um, but it can be prone to infection, inflammation, just like any other part of the body. Um, so the main causes of inflammatory CNS disease can be loosely grouped into infectious causes, non-infectious causes, and then we always have neoplasia, and that can be primary, so present within these structures, or it can be secondary when we have um, metastasis to these structures, or I guess they're widespread um, effects on these structures from whatever nasty things they're producing. Um, so if we're going through the infectious causes, um, we have quite a few. So we have bacteria, viruses, protozoa, fungi, rickettsia, and parasites. Um, bacteria, um, so bacterial meningitis, which can result in abscesses as well, quite common in puppies, but they do occur rarely in dogs. Um, often we can get extension from adjacent structures such as the ears, the sinuses, nasal passages, bones, um, or in puppies that are presenting with pericarditis, metritis, prostatitis, um, or discospondylitis, so infection of the spine or pretty much anywhere in the body. Um, it can travel to the meninges or um, the spine or the brain. Um, commonly the bacteria that we see because they're young and immunocompromised are those that are commensals. Um, so usually our Staphylococcus, Pasteurella, um, Astenomyces, um, things that are usually within our nose, nose pharynx, um, skin, anything like that. Often these dogs are quite systemically ill as well. So we can use that to determine, I guess, what is causing infection or inflammation at the end of the day. Our viruses, Similar to bacteria, it, can, it occurs mainly in young and immunocompromised dogs. Dogs that are vaccinated, these tend to not occur as often. Um, and it's mainly distemper and parvovirus. So they're two that we cover in our main vaccination schedules anyway. 
protozoa, um, this is where I guess it's important for our nurses to know why we have infectious and inf non-infectious causes as both Toxoplasma and Neospora can be transferred to humans. Um, toxoplasmosis being our main concern. Um, so the definitive host for toxoplasmosis um, is cats essentially. Um, so it usually occurs again in young or immu immunosuppressed dogs. Um, it acquires from essentially dogs will pick it up from the feces of cats um, or if they've left their feces on the grass it can pretty much sit in the environment for really long periods of time in these little oocytes um, and can be picked up in the sewer, uh, in the soil, water, food. Um, important to note that these infections, once they're acquired, they can lay dormant in the animal for years and never cause infection. However, if they're young or immunocompromised, then that might be enough for them to take hold and start developing within the host. Um, so I think in one study in the USA, 20% of dogs had a blood test, blood test suggestive of exposure, um, but they never presented for any signs of clinical disease, um, which is important to note. Um, particularly for pregnant women, this is when we get quite worried about having our nurses around these dogs. The, the risk is quite low, um, but it's still a known route of transmission. Um, so we'll need to put barrier nursing up until we've ruled out these infectious causes. Um, similar to this, we have Neospora. Um, so this is another proto, oh, I lost it. Protozoa infection that can cause uh, meningitis. And um, this can actually be passed on from um, the mother through the fetus and they can be born with it. Um, otherwise you can get it from ingesting um, contaminated tissues, mainly beef. Um, or uh, it can also be found in birds and small rodents as well. Um, similar, they can acquire this at any point in their life and it can remain dormant. Um, an active infection might not ever be, um, might, we might never know our animals have these, um, but it's definitely something we have to rule out being dangerous to humans as well. Um, then we have fungi, we have cryptococcus, um, and that's a little encapsulated yeast um, that's usually acquired by inhalation and can disseminate very easily from the nose up through the cribriform plate and then to our brain and all of those um, CNS structures. Uh, rickettsial meningitis, so we have two agents that can cause that, um, and that's rickettsia, rickettsii, um, and ehrlichia. Both of these are transmitted to dogs through ticks. Um, they're quite uncommon in New South Wales, but we always make sure if they've travelled to the Northern Territory or North Queensland, that's where we're going to find most of them. So checking where the dog has travelled um, and what it's exposed to, what prevention it's on is very important in these cases. Um, and finally, we have our parasites. Uh, the most common parasite we know we see is rat lungworm, um, which is known as neural angiostrongylasis. Um, where we actually have migration of these larvae through our CNS system. So it can have quite um, profound impacts on our animals. Um, essentially they reside within the rat, but then the rat feces is ingested by snails and slugs and our little puppies um, like to eat gross things that are moving. Um, so that's another thing that we ask commonly in our um, history, particularly in autumn and early winter when we're seeing snails and slugs come out, um, whether or not their dog is a scavenger and if they could have ingested something like this. Um, so there are infectious causes. Then we have non-infectious causes, which is super complicated and um, this is just a nice little picture to summarize it um, essentially it's just a blanket term for any sort of disease that hasn't had an infectious cause behind it to cause inflammation um, originally we had it grouped into several subtypes just based on where they their predilection site in the cns um, and their histopathology characteristics so what they looked like after we'd had taken biopsies. Um, but recently, annoyingly, as everything develops, we've changed the whole thing again. And it now falls under, um, well, part of it falls under a blanket term known as MUO, which is meningoencephalitis of unknown or origin. Um, essentially any disease that's 
um, non-infectious that we can see on histopathology, that we can see on our um, imaging, advanced imaging and CSF analysis. Um, we've been able to group under MUO. Um, so when I say, say histopathology, this is a picture of a brain, well, a slide of a brain. Um, we can see that there's, I guess, tissues here. Um, so in this group, we would expect to see changes on our histopathology, whereas in these three groups, we don't see changes or hardly ever see changes in our um, advanced imaging or very mild changes, but we never see changes in our histopathology. Um, so that's kind of how they've tried to group them. Um, yeah, it's a little bit confusing. I'm just going to kind of skim past it. Um, we would be here all night. Um, but essentially those that can be diagnosed on histopathology now come under MUO and those that can't, that are still non-inflammatory are in their just own little group. Um, so that is the necrotizing meningoencephalitis, well, encephalitis, and then they're their subgroups, which I don't even know if I've written down because I went over it really quickly. Um, so you have gram granulomatous meningoencephalitis, which is your GME, and then yeah, your necrotizing encephalitis. I think one of them is um, meningoencephalitis, so necrotizing meningoencephalitis and necrotizing leukoencephalitis. So it's all what they look like under hist histopathology essentially, um, but I'm not going to go into that because we'd be here all night. I didn't, I didn't enjoy the reading about it, so <laughs> I'm going to move on. Um, <laughs> so in dogs, meningitis is actually quite un an uncommon disease. There's only two types of the disease that we see quite commonly. Um, one of them is steroid responsive meningitis. Um, and unfortunately, the other one is MUO, MUE. Um, so what I was going to focus on now is steroid responsive meningitis is in clinic that's kind of what we've been dealing with most um, but I do have a case study to show you the difference between steroid um, responsive and MUE just because they present quite similarly and then our, I guess our role is to determine if just the meningitis if just the meninges is affected or if we have brain and spinal contribution as well ish um <laughs> So clinical findings, when we're talking about meningitis, um, it can be variable and it can depend on the uh, anatomical location and severity of inflammation. But in typical meningitis cases, we usually see cervical pain and rigidity. Um, and this is because we have a very dense innervation of meningeal tissue within the neck and it's also highly mobile. So it's gonna be an area where they're gonna hurt the most, whereas everything else kind of stays stuck quite stiff as we know. Um, in addition to that, we can get hyperesthesia um, and painful muscle spasms in this patient. And that can present as reluctance to walk. They can have a broad like stance, arch spine. They can be resistance to manipulation of the head and other areas of the body, such as the neck and limbs. Um, we also typically see fever. Um, and this can be due to muscle rigidity released from pyogens in our infectious courses. Um, in our inflammatory causes, leukocytes can cause pyrexia as well. And we can also have hypothalamic stimulation. So our brain detects that as well and also increases our body temperature. Um, and we can also get increases of intracranial pressure as well when we have severe inflammation. And that can also impinge on parts of our brain that cause vomiting, nausea, bradycardia, arrhythmias. So we can have quite a few things, but the main things we see is usually cervical pain and rigidity, um, fever, and sometimes other pain in other areas as well. And um, when we have severe enough meningitis, it can lead to secondary inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. Um, and then when we see that we have quite more, well, we have more severe neurological deficits. Um, so in addition to 
the clinical signs that we get with meningitis. We can also see changes in the in demeanor. They can become quite dull, depressed or agitated. We can get um, effects with all our cranial nerves, which can cause blindness, um, loss of balance or motor control. We can even get things like seizures, circling behavior and loss of consciousness, which is now starting to sound a little bit more like an intracranial lesion. Um, so the clinical signs and non-infectious inflammatory disorders, inflectious and in times neoplasia can in fact present similarly because we can have these quite severe neurological signs when we have involvement of our spine and our brain as well, not just the meninges. Um, usually with our neoplastic lesions, in most cases they are unilateral and sometimes we can use that to start to differentiate between neoplasia and our infectious inflammatory. Um, but without further diagnostics, we're never going to tell between non-infectious and infectious um, underlying causes of disease. So that's just a very quick summary of meningitis. Um, now, if we're focusing on, focusing on steroid responsive meningitis, arteriosis, um, so this is a disease that is believed to be autoimmune. Um, so it's resulting from dysregulation of an immune system that's um, causing inflammation that's leading to cellular dysfunction and destruction. Um, Essentially where it gets confusing is that we can have an initial inflammatory or non-inflammatory component that stimulated this immune system to attack itself. And um, so it kind of starts layering on top of each other. It can be hard to differentiate out. Um, so in other words, I guess our CNS system starts to attack its own components of itself, like the meninges, like it would if there was a foreign body there or some other pathogen in the body. Um, we can have acute and chronic forms. Acute forms, we usually just see the fever, maybe lethargy and neck pain. Um, and then with the chronic forms, the meninges become so scarred that we start to impinge on our um, on our spine and it can even travel to our brain and cause further neurological dysfunction. Um, and that's when we can get all the other neurological deficits such as ataxia, tetraparesis. So if we're going into the where it gets confusing but if we're going into the spine essentially it can form it can act like a lesion within the spine or that inflammation and thickening so we can get hind limb deficits we can get deficits of all front forelimbs and that's going to help us where we pick to go for our imaging um i'll go it'll be a little bit more clear when we go through the cases um but essentially we know we have meningitis or we know we're looking for meningitis if we have fever and neck pain and then we're looking for neurological deficits to see if it's traveled how far up it's traveled if it's in the spine or if it's in the brain um, so it occurs most commonly in young large breed dogs um, and the age of onset is typically under two years, but in some dogs we see it as old as seven years. Um, so this is why it's a very complicated disease to go through and I really regret doing this as a topic now, but sorry guys. Um, but there's no definitive test for this disease in the dog. Um, so we can only make a definitive diagnosis on post-mortem. Um, so this is why it can be very difficult to determine meningitis and then go into all of the subtypes of inflammatory CNS disease. Um, so we need clinical diagnosis. We make it based on clinical science supportive laboratory findings and exclusion of other diseases. Um, so when they come in, we look at their signalment, their age, their breed um, and their physical exam findings and see if they fit into our typical large breed dogs under two, can be up to seven. So it's still a little bit broad there. Um, we need to rule out all our infectious causes, so our bacteria, fungi, parasites, protozoa. We need all of that out before we can start um, treatment and then we need remission with treatment essentially. So I'll go through that um, later, but usually with SRMA is the um, heading explains steroids, it responds to steroids. <laughs> And um, so diagnostic, diagnostic, so our animals come in, it's a one-year-old dog, it's a Labrador, they're my favourite dogs, they're probably not the most good choice, but there's my dog there, that's my dog, yeah, yeah, little muffin, that's when his elbow was good anyway, 
Um, so my Labrador's come in, it's got neck pain, it's got a fever, it's lethargic, he's going off his food. Um, the first thing we do is usually just do a complete blood test and that includes a CBC biochemistry. Um, and sometimes we'll do a urinalysis in, if indicated as well. And that's usually our three step throwing a net broad spectrum um, kind of approach. Um, so on CBC, we typically might see an inflammatory leukogram, not always. So that's character by, characterized by in, increase in neutrophils, monocytes, and we might have a decrease in lymphocytes or eosinophils. Um, we can also get low albumin, and this is known as a negative acute phase protein. So that will be used up in inflammatory causes quite quickly, but not always. Um, other things we might do is because there's neck pain, the other thing we have to rule out is things like trauma, um, fractures to the neck or discospondylitis, so infection. Um, and we do that, we can either do that by radiographs um, or we can go straight to a CT scan. Um, in some of these cases and the particular ones we've seen um, with the signs that are coming in, sometimes they're quite focal to the neck. We'll just CT the neck um, or a little bit down the spine. In other cases, I guess when we have um, more severe neurological signs, uh, for instance, if, if we're getting um, tetraparesis or um, I guess issues with our reflexes in our hind limbs, we may opt to CT not only the spine, but go all the way down the spine um, and up obviously towards the brain as well. So we can see just where the extent of disease is. Um, so CT scan also helps us, I guess, determine intracranial disease as well. Um, but yeah, ultimately, we can start at CT and then we might go to MRI, <laughs> but I'll come to that in a sec. Um, so the other thing that we use quite commonly um, is biomarkers. The one that we have in-house is known as CRP, which is C-reactive protein. So these are also acute phase proteins like albumin um, that we can use to measure, I guess, the degree of inflammation within the body. So CRP and serum amyloid, they're released into the bloodstream when we have inflammation or infection. Um, CRP is also found in the cerebral spinal fluid as well. So when we tap that, when we come to that, we can also detect it on that. Um, an elevated CRP, so the number is normal range is one to 10. So elevated is anything over 10. If a dog comes in with fever, um, pain, lethargy, they've got this kind of blood work um, and we run a CRP and it's elevated, this makes us quite suspicious that we do have something like meningitis happening. Um, however, CRP can be elevated because it's not specific for meningitis, it can be elevated in any sort of inflammatory or infectious process. Um, one study did show that CRP tended to be most significantly elevated with meningitis, um, making it, I guess, more likely in these cases, um, but it can also happen in sepsis and in some cases their CRP is completely normal. Um, so maybe we've caught it early. I'm not too sure about that. I couldn't find too much on. Um, so we've done all of that. We've done CRP and for our sakes, it's around 100, which we see quite commonly. And um, in some cases, we will go to an MRI scan. Um, that's particularly helpful to rule out um, intracranial disease, but also in cases where we have severe inflammation. Um, before we go to a CSF tap, we do like to make sure that we don't have any brain herniation. Um, so that can occur when we've got severe inflammation in the spinal canal and it starts actually pulling the brain through the little foramen at the base of the skull. Um, if we stick a needle in there, we can pretty much exacerbate disease or cause, cause death. And so often we go to an MRI scan. In meningitis, um, we might not see anything. Um, in some cases, we can see enhancement of the meninges. So that's where those white arrows are pointing. So the brain matter itself, which is the dark gray, is quite normal. We can't see any lesions, no tumors, anything like that. Um, but we can see that the meninges outlining the brain is quite um, enhanced. 
Um, once we've done an MRI scan and not always, sometimes we won't go to CT, um, we won't go to MRI, sorry, we might do a CT, we'll try to do one or the other. Um, once we're pretty sure that there's no brain herniation or contraindications for a cerebrospinal fluid tap, um, we will go to that. And there's two places we can do that. Typically, we tend to do it at the lumbar cistern down on the back, um, but you can do it in the cerebromedullary cistern, which is right behind the neck, which most people don't really like to do. Um, we then send that off for cytology analysis and PCR, which I'll go through. Um, but essentially, if we have meningitis, we usually have an increase in the cell count in our CFS, CSF fluid as well as protein. Um, this is just to highlight the difference between meningitis and this case of MUO, where we had kind of lesions in the brain. Um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I haven't actually seen it while I've been here. I don't know whose head that is. It could be humans, I'm not sure. <laughs> and so CSF analysis. So we send off the CSF um, and this was just a quick little table to show you what normal CSF should be. So it should be colourless, clear. Um, we shouldn't have too many red blood cells, so erythrocytes, but we can get some contamination when we're making the puncture ourselves. Um, a nucleated cell count should be low and our total protein should be low. Um, so typically with meningitis, we're seeing an increase in the nucleated cell count, which is our white blood cells um, and total protein protein as well in indicative of inflammation um, yeah if you see with the total protein which is on the bottom left square <laughs> sorry i can't move anywhere oh yeah so you have a different protein level for the lumbar gallery versus lumbar so for the medicine as you might be described over that four minutes but when you're forgetting those samples for the lab it's really mm. important Mm. Oh, oh no. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so normal CSF, um, when we're talking about our nucleated cells, we usually see small lymphocytes, monocytoid cells, which I actually couldn't figure out what they were, some sort of B cells. Um, we can see neutrophils only up to 20% is normal and eosinophils, we shouldn't see more than 1%. Um, plasma cells, we don't typically see in CSF. Um, so that's something that I will go through shortly. Um, and then as we're taking the sample, we can get contaminant findings. So cells that are around the area, um, hemopoietic cells are precursors if we puncture bone marrow and if we puncture the, score, the cord or anything around it. We're going to see the other cords, the other cells. Um, so when we get our CSF analysis back, um, essentially, a lot of it, a lot of the time, it comes back as a mixed cell pleocytosis. Um, so that means that we have an increased white blood cell count, um, and we have multiple white blood cell lines increased. So we have our macrophages, lymphocytes, neutrophils, and plasma cells, which can all be increased, and that doesn't help too much um, in determining what's going on, as that can still have quite a lot of differentials, both infectious and non-infectious. Um, they kind of narrowed it down a little bit, but the more I went through it, the more overlap you see and it gets more confusing. Um, but our lymphocytes make us, if we have a predominant cell type of lymphocytes, and I'll go through this in the case study, um, we suspect it could be viral, it could be SRME, it could be the granulomatous type, necrotizing type, or it could be neoplasia. Um, neutrophils, we particularly associate with bacteria, um, but in acute stages of inflammation, we're going to get neutrophils. So we might see neutrophils in most of our um, causes of meningitis. Um, eosinophils usually relate back to our parasites, fungal, or protozoan infections, but we can also see it in our... Um, eosinophilic meningitis, um, SRMA, neoplasia as well. And macrophages, luckily, we typically only really see in granulomatous inflammation, but they can hang around in other ones if we've had um, long-standing inflammation going on. Um, so that's nice and confusing again. 
Um, so this used to be, I guess this was an older take on SRMA looking at the um, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, so we could get a predominative predominant suppurative or eosinophilic um, CSF back. Um, so now they're typically starting to say that we're getting those responses in response to what initially caused the SRMA, but they're all kind of encapsulating it under one thing. Um, but with SRMA, if we saw neutrophils or eosinophils increase or even lymphocytes, um, it would still be indicative that SRMA is still a possibility. So it's a little bit all over the place. And the other thing we do with our CSF and our blood testing, our CSF, we also send it off for a PCR panel. So that's going to cross off most of our infectious causes for us. So it covers toxo, crypto, angiostrongolus, the rat lungworm, neospora and canine distemper. And um, in some cases, we do get a dry tap with our CSF. So we don't always get to tap the CSF. Um, and in that case, that makes this a little bit more difficult. But luckily, we can send off some blood to test for Cryptococcus, Toxo and Neospora. And um, as I said, with Toxo and Neospora, and um, the only difficulty with that is that you can have previous exposure, but not have active infection. And um, so when we get the results back, we have, I guess, tiers of results where it can be a weak positive, a positive or a strong positive. A weak positive can indicate that they've been exposed to it. Um, and in that case, we might opt to repeat our toxo and neospora titers um, in four weeks. Um, if we're seeing that those um, testing levels are increasing, then we're, it's more indicative that these are active rather than previous. Otherwise, if it's staying at the same level, um, then we might just say it's exposure and that it's not actually the cause of our underlying disease. Um, okay, so where am I? This is a long one. Um, so essentially, we've got my dog that's come in, it had fever, neck pain, lethargy, we had some white blood cell changes, his CRP was off the charts, um, we did a CT scan and there was maybe some meningeal enhancement, no um, signs of no lesions, and um, then we did all of this testing as well and that all came back negative. Um, I guess on the basis of all of that, what we start to do is do a treatment trial with steroids. Steroids, <laughs> not these steroids. But I once had a client ask me being like, you're putting my dog on steroids, like gym steroids? And I was like, yeah, but we're not. It's a completely different steroid. <laughs> I love if my chocolate Labrador came out like that. Um, so once that we once we got all that back, we do stabilize the patient. Um, and that includes the addition of pain relief. So we might opt for paracetamol. Um, thank you, Alex going through paracetamol um, and supportive treatment. So if we do have hypersalivation or they're having other effects such as lethargy, all of that, and um, we can give them meropotent and things like that to counteract any other side effects they're having. Um, now at NVS, um, we do actually commence prophylactic antibiotics. So we commence clindamycin um, and this other actually covers our toxo and our neospora. Um, so we start that prophylactically until we get those infectious titers back. Um, if they do come back as a weak positive, we may opt to keep them on those for four weeks before we retest it. Um, and then even longer if they're truly positive, but that's just as a precaution. Um, some clinicians can put them on prophylactic antifungals um, for cryptococcus, but I haven't seen that being done. Um, and what we eventually do is commence an immunosuppressive. Um, some clinicians will start this. So with our in immunosuppressive, we can have anti-inflammatory doses at a low dose, and then we can have immunosuppressive doses at high doses. In some cases, some clinicians will start at an anti-inflammatory dose while we're waiting for our infectious titers to come back. And that's because if we suppress the immune system, they're not going to be able to fight all of our infectious causes, even though they're not that common. Um, typically what we do is we give them a intravenous injection of dexamethasone and um, POMS, 
says it's really high at 0 0.5 to 1. We typically use 0 0.35 um, mix per kg IV. And then we observe their response over the next 24 to 48 hours. And um, typically we start high doses of prednisolone after that time period. At, or we usually do about two to four mg per kick. Um, and essentially the mainstay of treatment is this steroid. So we're gonna keep them on that high dose uh, for about three to four weeks or until they're clinically stable. Um, in dogs where we've had elevated CRP, we might actually retest that at the recheck. Um, and if that's coming down, then we might opt to start tapering that dose very slowly. Um, if remission is going to occur, it most commonly occurs while we're tapering this dose. Um, so remission, we might see them become um, painful in the neck again, lethargic, inappetent, or a fever might come back. Um, or if we're using CRP as one of our... Um, indicators of treatment that might start to go back up. Um, so I guess the goal is to completely taper them off. In some cases we can't and they're on a very low dose for a very long time. In other cases, prednisolone on its own is not enough and we might add in another immunosuppressive drug, usually something like cyclosporin. Um, there is heaps of them out there. And that was another rabbit hole I didn't want to go down. Um, yes. So getting to the end of it, this is my summary for meningitis. <laughs> Steroids. <laughs> yeah. Um, so prognosis, most of our SRMI, SRMA dogs respond really, oh, this is my dog as well, <laughs> respond really well to immune suppression therapy. And um, as I said, some require additional medications, um, but with early aggressive therapy, we usually get to cure 60 to 80% of our cases and 20 to 40% of those will experience relapse. So we tell our clients all of this as we go through. Um, and as I said, we you, will use CRP as a biomarker for us to assess their response to treatment and levels of inflammation. Um, a very quick case study that the medicine girls know um, is we have Otto Smith and Charlie Hicken. Um, so they both presented with, I guess, similar but a little bit different um, clinical signs. So they're both quite young, under two. Um, Charlie presented mainly just with pyrexia, um, lethargy, hypercelivation or a really stiff neck, which progressively became worse. Um, so we thought it was focusing just around the cervical um, spine. With Otto, um, initially we thought this was an IVDD case. It actually presented to Eugene first because um, it had hind limb paresis and that actually progressed to um, I guess deficits in all four limbs um, so they actually ended up doing a CT scan for us but um, Eugene came to the um, conclusion that there was multi multifocal disease so we had spinal pain but as well as pain on the thoracolumbar palpation we're having all these issues with our um all these neurological issues um of all four limbs as well as a dull mentation so we're like maybe something else is happening a little bit more than just the spine here and the neck um, labs were done on both of them. Um, we had an inflammatory leukogram with Charlie um, and his CRP, we did run that and that was 96.5. So quite significantly elevated considering that 10 is the highest range, uh, normal range. Um, we didn't perform a CRP on Otto, um, but all of his bloods were unremarkable. Um, the CT scan, so the main thing we saw in Charlie is it was pretty much unremarkable apart from this possible meningeal enhancement of the cervical spinal cord. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find his CT reports, but this would be like the meninges um, that's highlighted here that would be enhanced. I don't think it looked that impressive. Um, whereas compared to Otto, we saw these multi multifocal contrast enhancing lesions. Um, so all of these we saw scattered throughout the spinal cord, which is quite significant. Um, and the, yeah, so we were thinking at that point that Charlie was looking more like a men typical meningitis case, whereas Otto, that he was looking more like a granular murtis, um, meningoencephalitis case. Um, so to give you a little bit more context, both of them had a CSF tap, 
both of them had increased protein, increased white cell count. Um, Charlie's was predominantly neutrophilic inflammation, where Otto's was predominantly um, macrophage inflammation. So when we have um, increased macrophages, that's also known as granular matis inflammation. So that's where the granular matis meningoencephalitis comes from. Um, we also did all the neural PCR and blood testing on both of them, and all of that was negative as well. So we ruled out most of our infectious causes, which is why we're coming back to our non-inflammatory causes. Um, so we thought Harley was most likely SRMA and Otto was most likely GME. Um, with GME, you can do biopsies of the lesions um, because on histopathology, it would come back as something significant. Um, but in both cases, we treated them quite similarly. Um, so both of them were started on DEX and then prednisolone at quite high doses. Um, we started highly on paracetamol for his neck pain and meropitin because he also presented hypersalivating. So we knew that was having some effect um, on that system. With Otto, this is a whole nother kettle of fish, but essentially cytarabine is a chemotherapy agent that has immunosuppressive effects, um, but the owners didn't opt to start that. Um, so SRMA had a really good prognosis. Um, CRP, when we repeated it at two weeks after being on PRED for two weeks, it had come back within range at 1.3. So that was at like 96 or whatever before. Um, unfortunately with GME, um, because we have all of these lesions within the spinal cord so all those macrophages formed those lesions um, it has a really poor to guarded prognosis um, essentially there's space of occupying tumors within the cord and the brain um, and we actually saw him today for retech and he's quite deteriorating neurologically and he's actually probably going to be put down soon um, but yeah that's kind of how meningitis and then you go everything else and I'm done <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> yeah, I regret that. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, Any questions for Jack? No. Um, I think from a nursing point of view, probably the key things would be like documenting trends in these dogs. Like they can just think really quickly they don't even make their recheck appointments so if you're seeing bradycardia or changes in mentation particularly bradycardia with hypertension so we're worried about increased intracranial pressure like grab us like tell us because they can just go from being very well to very abnormal very quickly so they go it's need really consistent and attentive nursing care and i also thought i really love that you brought up toxoplasma so I'll just briefly touch on this because that's a question I get a lot from a nursing perspective in terms of the infection control. And so you might see that there are signs on the cage that say like potential toxoplasma, potential zoonotic disease exposure. The risk to you guys is really low, but we highlight the risk mostly just so you are aware. So the way that toxoplasma works in cats is they eat, let's say you've got toxoplasma in some raw kangaroo that they've been fed. They eat that the toxoplasma goes through their gut, they poo it out, then over five days, those um, what they call oocysts sporulate. And then if the dog comes and eats that poo that's been sitting out for five days, they can then get the, like those organisms are now infectious. The dog eats the infected poo, goes through their gut, and then it can spread through their whole body. So that's kind of the process that it takes. If they eat like a fresh poo from the cat's butt, can't cause them a problem because those organisms haven't had a chance to become infectious. So the risk, like for that all to happen is pretty uncommon. Probably the ones that we highlight the most is cats that have potential toxoplasma. So what happens is they eat the toxoplasma in that raw kangaroo, it goes through their gut, and then that toxoplasma goes through their gut to the rest of their body. So in this situation, to their brain. So it's not in their poop, so don't worry. And by the time it's gone through their gut and had a chance to spread to their brain, they've pooped it all out. Like if they are here with us, they've already done their infectious poo at home. They're not doing infectious poo in the hospital. And even then, we're not letting their poo sit in their litter for five days. 
Yeah. And then also the argument is, well, what if they then get poo on their coat and then they groom, like they're such fastidious groomers that they normally will groom it away anyway. So the risk to you is if you then go and eat that cat. So you need to like, yeah. So you need to like eat their brain or if we're worried it's in their liver and we've done like aspirates and you're, let's say we get aspirates from the liver, we spray it on the slide, you then inhale the slide. Like all these things need to happen. So the risk is low, but, <laughs> but the, the, like there is still a very small risk. And if you're immunocompromised or pregnant, that's where we worry. So when we say possible toxoplasmosis, so you can make a decision about what your risk is, if you just wash your hands after you eat the cat, like, <laughs> well, that's not true. But if you just wash your hands after you handle the cat, then you should be okay. Yeah. I literally spent my whole semester this um, semester like researching toxoplasmosis like since we were dogs, and there are like like it's like forty or fifty percent of dogs are picking up toxoplasmosis. Yeah. And apparently, like most of us have already been exposed. And already been exposed so like, like do you know the percentage of humans i reckon we all like the most of us would have especially yeah like, i'm sure yeah and, and they're like sure. it's not even worth testing people because it's like not an issue and it's not yeah really so i haven't seen this site then that's a really good point is so our exposure is potentially to cats poo but you just have just as much a risk eating salad that's not been cooked meat, that's contaminated like, or, or raw meat or I understand you have never eyeballed the study, but I think they tested your immune response to toxoplasma if you work in the veterinary field versus just a normal person out in the community, and your risk of exposure is no higher. So you, like, still, by all means, if you have any concerns, chat to your primary healthcare professional, and particularly if you're pregnant or immunocompromised, you should do that. But if you just have good hand hygiene, your chances are very, very low, but... We put those signs so you can make your own personal decision about your potential exposure. So if you see that, just try not eat anything that you shouldn't. Actually, I have a question for you, Liz, like in regards to that. Yeah. In terms of like using prophylactic clindamycin, mm. like are we worried about that in terms of like antibiotic stewardship and like yeah. using it? Absolutely. Need to, and if so many of these tests come back negative, why? Very good question. I love that you asked that and I have an answer. Um, <laughs> so the risk that we have is those infectious titers that we can test toxoplasma and neospora for, they take 14, day, 14 business days to get a result back. So in animals where we have a high index of suspicion, we might put them on clindamycin, but they do need to tick a few boxes. So just coming in with net pain and a fever, in my opinion, and it is clinician preference, Josh might have a different um, take, but that's not enough for me to put you on clindamycin. If you're a cat that gets fed raw kangaroo meat, and we know that's a risk factor for, for um, toxoplasma exposure, or you're a dog that gets all the raw meat in its diet, then we'd be a bit more worried about that. So I think they need to tick a few extra boxes, but you're absolutely right. We shouldn't be using it if we don't have a decent index of suspicion. And probably in that situation, if they're pretty stable, you probably wouldn't use it. But if they've got dalmentation or like brain science, I'm like, if I don't get this decision right, this dog's going to die. You can make an argument for it because we're going to de-escalate as soon as we get those results back. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Can I ask one last question? This actually might be more Jess, but for um, <laughs> When we talk about, Jess mentioned lumbar and back of the neck as the two main areas. And then you said they like to do lumbar, not so much back of the neck. Why? Yeah. I, well, the fear of actually, God. I was actually yeah. researching it, but yeah, it's mainly just the preference because the milk is safer. It's safer. But essentially my research said that you actually get more diagnostic and results from, yeah. <laughs> so we're starting to do the... Yeah. <laughs> What Jess is very diplomatically saying is that I'm a wuss. And so, <laughs> well, only if you don't know if their brain's herniating or not. So you don't like pit the brain if it's in their spinal cord, which often we like to do MRI. So it's hard to see that on CT. Sometimes you can see it. 
but if you've done an MRI first, then the chance of that is low. And my understanding of the literature is that the risk of sudden death is no greater in lumbar versus cisternal. I just happened to train somewhere where we're all afraid of it. So I was trained to be afraid of it. And despite seeing Anna and Dave do so many cisternal taps, I can't not be afraid of it. So I need to get over that. And yeah, that's my problem. Uh, we're going to yeah. get one like tomorrow now. Yeah. Oh, no. So mm. if you have an MRI, you'd be way more comfortable doing it up there, aren't you sure that there's no herniation? Yes. Okay. And the trouble that I have is because I'm so afraid of it, so I'm afraid of it for animals dying, is that, Often by the time we get to CSF, we're pretty sure we know what we're dealing with based on the signal meant. Like there's just a saying like SRMA, if you're a large breed young dog with neck pain and a fever, you have SRMA until proven otherwise. If you're a seven-year-old pug with multifocal brain disease, you have NME until proven otherwise. Like we can kind of pick it. So if I know I'm probably going to throw steroids at it no matter what, do you want to kill the dog just to do my CSF tap? <laughs> Probably not. Chances of that are low, but yeah, it's no. weighing it all up. Sure. But we should do more cisternal. And there are some places that do like at North Shore, they do cisternal and lumbar. They do both. I was going to say, if, if you get a dry tap on lumbar, could you try? Definitely. Yeah. 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 I think I remember reading that um, lumbar taps are better for rat lumbar because they descend from the. And they migrate up. I mean, in, in theory, it's all meant to communicate and like it should be representative, but whether that's real world. And I think it might be that we used to get away with it, but now that we pick these things up earlier and probably dogs are getting tapped earlier because we know about rat lung worm more that maybe we are picking it up when it is more kind of lumbar-ish than higher up. Okay. Sorry, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> with brain herniation, like being worried about that, mm -hmm. would they, like, is there a chance that they could not be clinical and have brain herniation or would it be pretty, like, they will be neurologically? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, they should be clinical. I think it probably depends on their breed. So if they're like a cavy whose default status is maybe like a bit of brain herniation on a good day anyway, like, <laughs> sorry, who am I offending? Oh, sorry. Lovely dogs, but structurally questionable. Um, like, you know, they probably have a higher tolerance. So, yeah. And have you ever seen it? Have you, you guys have a cisternal tap go bad? Yeah, the problem is you have like one go badly and then you just write them off forever. But you've like lumbar ones can go badly and we go, well, that was part of the diagnostic procedure. But then cisternal ones go and it's just like burnt in your brain. Uh, is it like high versus death? Uh, no, it's kind of like death versus death. Oh, okay. Yeah. It just, I think in our mind, the brain is so much further away from the lumbar space that we think will be fine. Yeah. And then when it doesn't go well, we still have that like anatomical distance that we're like, it had bad disease, you know? Yeah. But when it's this day and it's like, well, I was near the brain, it's totally my fault and I'm not going to sleep ever again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd expect it to be clinical at that point, Nina. Even a cavi should show some. All right, King, you're up. I know, I love that. <laughs> okay, Danielle, is that working? Yeah, I can see toxicology. Great, thank you. All right, King, you're up. Right, so you. you might have to just press the arrow button oh, yeah. with your mouse. Yeah, that's than, all. Um... Uh, yeah, that yep. makes sense. Great. Great. All right, lucky last. Jess's introduction is a bit of a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you all tonight for turning up and thanks Mel for tuning in. Uh, intoxications are common presentations in ECC settings. 
it's a huge topic. And as we are no doubt aware, there are many textbooks out there that run into hundreds, if not thousands of pages. So I won't be attempting the impossible tonight and trying to cram this whole rich and wonderfully complex subject into 30 minutes. Uh, so what we'll do instead um, is we'll get acquainted with some key terms and concepts in toxicology. Uh, then we'll explore our general approach to intoxication, which I hope is a sensible way to go. Uh, life would be very difficult if we have to memorize a unique approach to each poison that we encounter and the list of the poisons is very long. Uh, so I initially did intend to take us through some common toxicants, but half an hour simply just doesn't allow enough room for that. So let's get into our uh, important terms. Um, so the terms on this page, it's probably something you've heard before, but for every specialty or profession out there, there's a set of terms uh, and concepts that allow members to communicate clearly and accurately. So let's take a look at uh, some of these things here. Uh, so let's start with, um, uh, hang on. Let's start with toxicology, which is the study of poisons. It covers the nature of poisons and their effects on animals. In the clinical setting especially, uh, toxicology also deals with the diagnosis and treatment of poisonings. Next, we have uh, this set of words, intoxication, toxicosis, and poisoning, uh, which are used interchangeably and basically refers to the pathological condition of being poisoned, be it through ingestion, inhalation, application onto the skin, or any other route. Then we have the word toxic, uh, which is the adjective for substances that are deemed poisonous. Uh, but as we will see shortly, uh, everything can potentially be poisonous. Uh, practically speaking, then the term toxic is reserved for substances that have the highest likelihood of causing harm. So a toxicant is a poison. Uh, it is uh, a substance that can cause harmful effects by its inherent qualities. So this excludes things that cause harm primarily through mechanical means, such as a knife or extremes of temperature, such as fire. When used technically, toxicant is different from intoxicant, uh, which are substances that have psychoactive effects. So ethanol, for instance, which is the alcohol in drinks, is a well-known intoxicant. The word uh, toxin is commonly used interchangeably with poison, but specifically it actually refers to poisons that come from biological sources. To make the meaning more apparent, the prefix bio is often added in front of the word, uh, but technically the two words uh, mean the same thing. Then we have subcategories of toxins. So bacterial toxins uh, can be split up into exotoxins and endotoxins. You have your zootoxins, which come from animals, uh, phytotoxins from plants, phycotoxins from seaweed and algae, and mycotoxins uh, from fungi. Okay, so looking, uh, looking deeper, uh, dosage refers to the amount of substance in this particular context, the poison. Uh, that has been administered to an individual relative to its weight. The amount is commonly expressed in milligrams and the weight is commonly given in kilos, hence uh, mixed per kg. Uh, dose, on the other hand, refers to the total amount of poison that has been administered, irrespective of weight. So owners will often give us information about the dose, and from there, using the patient's weight, you can work out the dosage. Toxicity refers to the degree to which something is poisonous. We can think of it as the lowest amount of poison that's required to produce a harmful effect. A substance that only requires a small amount is more poisonous, so the greater the toxicity, the lower the dosage required. Then we'll find these uh, different measures of toxicity. One measure is the lethal dose, or LD, which is the lowest dosage that causes death. It's followed by a number, which refers to the percentage of individuals that will die from the specified dosage. The most commonly used number is 50, which gives us a median lethal dose, or LD50, which is the dosage that will kill half the test subjects when exposed to a particular dosage of a particular poison. Another common measure is toxic dose, or TD50. Uh, so this is the dosage that will result in a toxic effect in half of all test subjects. With the lethal dose, the, um, the toxic effect is obviously death. Uh, so with toxic dose, the actual effect must be specified, otherwise it won't be meaningful. Uh, so this is a very commonly um, uh, commonly used quote. It's found in a lot of textbooks, and it's um, attributed to the German Swiss physician and alchemist uh, back when they were still alchemists in 1538. <laughs> uh, so he he's, he wrote that all things are poisonous and nothing is without poison. So the dosage alone makes it so a thing is not a poison or or is a poison. So that's a mouthful which is often paraphrased into uh, the dose makes the poison. Um, so it's a, quite an important um, 
concept in toxicology. So it's not the substance itself, uh, but rather the dose that determines whether something is poisonous or not. Uh, so to illustrate this point, uh, water can be toxic when consumed in large enough quantities. There was a real life incident where this has occurred. In 2007, a woman in California died from water intoxication. She was um, in a radio competition called Hold Your Wee for a Wee where contestants were tasked with drinking as much water as possible without urinating, and that did not end well for her. Um, so on the flip side, um, sometimes even toxins that are regarded as highly toxic can produce no detectable detrimental effects if it's taken in low enough quantities. So this here is an interesting table uh, that shows us the median lethal dose of some very familiar substances, so water, sugar, salt, alcohol, ibuprofen, and caffeine. Uh, so even though you can see that water has a vastly higher LD50 compared to other substances, um, it takes about 90 mils uh, per kilo to kill a person, so about 25 cups. Uh, but as per that example, humans can sometimes surprise us with how much uh, they can drink. On the other hand, you can get substances uh, with a lower LD50 that can be extremely difficult to get poisoned by. So sugar is a good example. It's got a lower LD50 than water, but I can't imagine anyone um, consuming 168 tablespoons in one sitting. Um, so this other concept uh, here, the dose response relationship um, is also a simple but important concept. Um, it's the idea that the amount of, uh, amount of exposure is usually predictably and positively correlated with the severity of response. Uh, moreover, this is a reliable relationship. Uh, so there's a reliable relationship between the level of exposure and also the type of clinical signs that it generates. So the table here shows um, the dose dependent effects of ibuprofen. Uh, not only are the signs more severe at higher doses, but the organ systems that are affected also varies depending on the dose. So you get the gastrointestinal effects, then you move on into the nephrotoxic effects, and then at really high doses, you'll also get CNS effects as well. Uh, so another basic concept is that um, is another concept that most people intuitively already, already know. So a given substance is relatively non-toxic to some species while being highly toxic to others. Uh, so still referring to this table, you can see that there are differences between dogs and cats. Cats are generally more sensitive to, uh, than dogs, um, even when talking into mix per kick, which factors out the inherent differences in weight. Uh, the general response, however, is still similar. There are other instances where there can be quite dramatic differences. So chocolate is a good example. Uh, there's another interesting example here, um, which uh, involves the funnel web spider. So their, their venom is quite toxic to primates, uh, but dogs and cats don't really seem to be affected by their, by their venom. Um, in addition to variations uh, between species, there is also variations uh, within the species. So remember that information on toxicity is derived from data pulled from many individuals within the population. We need to study the effects of the poison on multiple subjects within a population in order to make general inferences. Uh, so that's because one individual in the population will differ slightly or sometimes greatly from the next. So I guess um, in Alex's case, that Pomeranian, that um, could be an outlier. Okay. So let's crack on with our general approach. Um, it's organized into these three categories. So um, we'll look at initial contact. Uh, so that's where triage over the telephone happens. Uh, then you get your uh, immediate things that you need to deal with. So you need to assess and stabilize the patient, uh, perform decontamination measures. And then later on, you can think about antidote supportive care, further diagnostics and getting a more refined history. Okay, so unless the client simply turns up at the front door, which they sometimes do, uh, the first point of contact is over the telephone, which provides some valuable opportunities to get some more basic information. So you can start with the pet, uh, ask about the signalment, ask about the weight, ask about how it's doing right now. Um, owners may sometimes know the weight, but more often uh, they won't. Uh, knowing the breed or asking them to give an estimate may help. Um, so the estimate uh, of the weight is a good starting point of estimating the dosage and this then allows us to make a risk assessment. Um, if the patient is showing alternation or having seizures, uh, it's a good idea to advise caution to the client when they're um, transporting them to hospital. Generally speaking, any animal that is scared or in pain will react unexpectedly and atypically. A uh, heavy blanket is very useful. It's easier to bundle a patient up for transport if they're seizuring or tremoring. 
and it also provides protection for clients and also to their cars if the animal is throwing up or having diarrhea. Uh, so assuming the owner has alerted us uh, to the potential poisoning, we can then ask more targeted questions about the poisoning itself. So you can start with uh, what happened. Uh, without sounding rude, uh, we should try to work out whether the client actually saw the event or inferred it in some way. And it's not always apparent which is which, uh, just by the way they're giving their account. Uh, next, we want to determine as specifically as possible what the substance may be. So if possible, we should ask them to bring in the packaging or the plant or the food. Um, and if they can't, uh, see if they can take a picture of the item. We want to try and get enough information to estimate the dose as accurately as possible, because as, um, as mentioned, an initial risk assessment will be quite helpful. Um, as with any history, um, but more importantly, when dealing with cases of intoxication, the timing is quite important. Uh, this information can raise or lower our suspicion of a poisoning. For example, if a poison um, we think might have eaten something with severe and rapid effects but shows up completely fine, that might make us think that lower than feared doses were ingested. The timing also helps us assess the relative benefit of uh, inducing uh, emesis. Uh, then we can move on to some more uh, general questions about the background. So knowing what uh, current medications uh, the patient is on is important. Uh, they can sometimes be the cause of the problem or add to the problem. Uh, so as an example, if we're worried about a patient with um, NSAID toxicosis and they're already on NSAIDs for management, say of arthritis, uh, that's really important information to know. Uh, also revealing sometimes other medications that, uh, that the owner is uh, taking themselves. So things like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, decongestants in pseudoephedrine. Um, and supplements can sometimes be a blind spot as well. So a lot of owners will not voluntarily uh, give that information, even unless specifically asked. So you can have a conversation with them about the medications, about their diet, uh, but they still won't really mention anything about supplements un unless you ask them. Uh, the pet's environment or lifestyle can also provide some valuable insight. Uh, the risk of exposure to toxins and the types of possible exposures will vary according to the environment. So having unsupervised outdoor access opens up a whole world of potential toxicants. So things like poisonous plants, mushrooms, yard treatment, uh, dirty water, and the list goes on. Uh, the walking route or off-lead areas that they might be, uh, that the owners might take them could be relevant as well, especially if uh, things like 1080 baiting is suspected in an area where they live. Um, children and visitors are also common culprits for unintentionally giving pets something toxic to eat. Uh, current illness is always good to know. Um, so it affects the way we manage the patient and it also influences our prognosis. And one other point to um, uh, perhaps mention is uh, to ask the client if they have any other pets. Sometimes uh, they'll only bring one, uh, the, the one they consider the naughty one, uh, when in fact they've got other pets at home that might have also had access. All right, so the list here um, on, the, on the following slide, so this slide here, uh, may help us in cases where the clients are unsure or unaware of possible intoxication. Um, it's quite common for clients not to suspect intoxication. Uh, they might not have witnessed the event or they might have seen it, but failed to appreciate its significance. So this uh, list of questions here, if they answer yes to any of these, it makes us a bit more suspicious that poisoning might have occurred. Um, simply, yeah, the other note uh, is that simply asking the owners if they think poisoning might have occurred uh, doesn't always help. Uh, where possible, if you're suspicious of a particular toxicant, um, asking them directly about that one could, uh, could be more useful. Uh, so on the topic of taking history, uh, it's worth mentioning that it's not a straightforward process. Um, we should keep in mind that where the shame or guilt involved, um, the information provided may not be entirely accurate. Likewise, information regarding situations where drugs are involved, uh, the owners may not be very willing to talk about um, what actually happened. And then on the topic of uh, telephone triage, uh, we'll jump ahead for a minute and just talk about ocular decontamination because it's quite time sensitive. Uh, we generally advise owners not to invest, uh, instigate home treatment, but exceptions can be made for ocular exposures. Um, so we may still be, of course, be limited by the client's ability uh, to perform uh, this procedure. Um, but if they can, ask them to flush the eye for 20 minutes. Uh, no animal will sit there for 20 minutes straight. So 20 minutes uh, as in flushing repeatedly over a course of 20 minutes. 
If it sounds like the client can't do this, then it's best not to waste time and just ask them to come down as quickly as possible. Uh, so then the next topic of whether the owner should induce emesis at home or not, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, there are situations where vomiting is contraindicated and it can be quite difficult to make that call over the phone. Um, additionally, as with um, ocular decontamination, it can be quite difficult for clients to do at home. I think in most cases, it would probably take longer for the owner to try and get hold of hydrogen peroxide 3%, catch the pet and administer it effectively. And that's all time spent not coming down for treatment. So DIY vomiting is advised only in cases where there is no better alternative. Uh, it can be considered if it takes over an hour to get to hospital and the client is confident they can make the pet vomit within a shorter time frame. One tip for owners to ensure that the peroxide they're using is fresh is by pouring it out uh, onto the hand or onto the sink. Um, if it fizzes or foams, that assures that it's still effective. Another tip to maximize the amount of uh, vomit uh, that you can make the pet bring up is just to give them a small meal beforehand. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is not recommended for cats. Uh, it can cause severe bloody vomiting and hemorrhagic gastritis, and it's only effective in about 30% of cases, as opposed to 90% in dogs. So things that aren't recommended include salt, uh, ipecac detergent, and uh, sticking your fingers down their throats. Uh, salt is not a reliable emetic and can cause life-threatening hyponatremia. Ipecac is not as effective as hydrogen peroxide and it can be cardiotoxic. And detergents are not recommended because it poses an aspiration risk. Uh, so this is a great resource, uh, the Animal Poisons Control Center. Um, so they provide uh, an invaluable support service for us and for the owners as well. So we, all the clients can call them at any time. They're available around the clock, which is amazing. And it's what we need for this type of service as poisonings can happen at any time of day. It's staffed by specialists and they have a lot of information available at their fingertips. Um, and again, exactly what we need. Um, there's yeah, so many different poisons out there um, and so many permutations um, with regards to the dose and with the species that having a specialist uh, uh, on tap with a, with a database at their disposal is really handy. And uh, being Australian, they also have uh, locally relevant information. So this is a good service uh, that we can call or you can also ask the clients to call before coming in to see us. Okay, so the patient has arrived. Uh, so we're onto our ABCs. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just move pretty quickly through this topic. Uh, so first A is for airway. Uh, it's a basic check just to see if airway patency is there. It's also a check for potential threats to the airway, such as reduced consciousness, paralysis, uh, physical obstruction, fluid accumulation within the oropharynx and any swelling. Uh, then we've got B for breathing. Uh, we should assess for adequacy of oxygenation and ventilation. Uh, so in other words, whether the patient is getting enough oxygen into the lungs and carbon dioxide out of the lungs. Uh, so basically, just know that uh, we have at our disposal various ways to assess ventilation, both with and without the use of equipment. So this is all stuff that we can do without uh, testing and equipment. And then these are things to further refine our understanding of uh, what's going on with the patient. With things like blood gases and lactate, only a small volume of fluid is needed to get started. So we're talking about volumes that can be obtained through a catheter. Uh, then we, uh, we've got C for circulation. Uh, we primarily gauge adequacy um, of perfusion and oxygenation. Uh, so that's delivery of blood to tissue. Um, so conversely, by definition, shock is the inadequate perfusion. Uh, like with breathing, we've got a combination of ways to make an assessment. Um, so these are six uh, perfusion parameters that we can do without any special equipment. Cementation, taking heart rate, assessing the pulse quality, looking at, looking at their mucous membranes, capillary refill time, and also gauging the temperature of their extremities. Uh, so note here, uh, brick red uh, mucous membrane colors and warm extremities may indicate septic shock, anaphylaxis, or heat stress. Uh, so yeah, so we can then back up our physical exam findings with these tests and measurements. And here are some ways that we can support their airway and breathing and some ways we can support their, um, their circulation. 
All right, so although it's not part of our handy uh, ABC list, uh, seizures and tremors should be addressed as part of our initial assessment and stabilization as well. Uh, so with seizures, we've got a number of different drugs that we can use depending on the circumstance. Uh, with tremors, methocarbamol is our drug of choice. All right, so then we've got um, ways, yeah, uh, decontamination. So there's various ways to uh, perform uh, decontamination of the gastrointestinal tract. We can induce vomiting, we can lavage the stomach, and then after that we can administer activated charcoal and perform an enema. The goal of de uh, decontamination is to limit uh, continued exposure. So we want to minimize absorption and promote the excretion of the toxicant from the body. So one of the main decisions uh, initially is to whether or not uh, to initiate uh, vomiting. As we'll see in the coming slide, there are many situations where, uh, where vomiting is actually contraindicated. Uh, but let's start with why and when we should. Uh, the aim of inducing vomiting is to remove as much of the toxicant as possible before it gets absorbed uh, or passes further down into the intestinal tract. We should consider emesis in asymptomatic patients uh, where the time of ingestion is unknown or, with, uh, or if it's recent, and also when the ingested thing is known to remain in the stomach for a long period of time. So things like grapes and raisins, uh, chewing gum, chocolate, food in wrappers, uh, sustained release medications. These are all things that tend to stay in the stomach. Uh, so although we typically recommend um, emesis within the first hour or two, um, those things can, um, inducing vomiting in these cases uh, where grapes and these other things are in, uh, ingested can also be quite helpful. Uh, we also really want to induce um, vomiting uh, in cases where we know the substance is highly toxic. Okay, so it's also important to, uh, to consider when inducing vomiting is not recommended. Uh, so the main contraindications are if the patient is already symptomatic or if there's an increased risk of aspiration. So there's a whole list of um, uh, possible scenarios where uh, aspiration risk is increased, uh, such as uh, altered mentation, seizuring, if they've ingested things like hydrocarbons, detergents, uh, if they've got megaesophagus, reduced gag, uh, brachycephalics you can do, but do with, uh, with caution. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, you also want to be very careful and about inducing vomiting where there's suspicion that they might have ingested something caustic or corrosive or where they've ingested something that's sharp. Um, and then there's a few other scenarios. So if, uh, if they've eaten something, uh, a medication that's rapidly absorbed, it might not be very effective. If they're already vomiting um, or if they've been given antiemetics already. So things like uh, if they've already had moropatin from the referring vet, um, if they've had benzodiazepines, or um, in cases of marijuana intoxication, because marijuana is a very good um, antiemetic. Um, okay, so now that we've gone over the do's and don'ts, let's talk about how to actually do it. Uh, Aphimorphine is a great choice for dogs. It works in over 90% of cases. As a tip, um, it is more effective on a non-empty stomach, so you can choose to feed the patient a small amount of wet food first. It may be given intravenously, uh, but subcutaneous or intramuscular works, uh, routes work pretty quickly as well. It can also be given transmucosally, so if you don't have the injectable form, um, you can use the tablet form. Uh, you can rub it onto the gums or um, you can dissolve it in water and instill it into the conjunctival sac. Uh, this method can be quite irritating and it stains the tears a nasty green colour. So if you're going to do that, just remember to rinse the eye out afterwards. Uh, so now talking about cats. Uh, cats, as usual, are a little bit different and they can be challenging. Uh, when they don't want to do something, chances are they, they get their way. So aphimorphine doesn't work very well in cats. It only works in about 10% of the time and it causes sedation. So you often end up just with a very sedated cat, but no vomiting. Uh, sometimes it can also produce an, the opposite effect uh, known as morphine mania. So with cats, uh, we use uh, dexmedetomidine or xylosine, which is an older drug also belonging to the class of alpha adrenergic agonists. It has about a 50% uh, success rate. Uh, some sources will say that uh, its success rate is higher. Uh, so the adverse effects are also similar to aphimorphine, um, and you've also got a reversal agent handy, which, um, which is atipomazole. Uh, so here's a rundown of how to perform a gastric lavage. Important things to note is that it requires a general anesthetic um, in order for it to be successful, and the airway must be protected. Uh, 
you may also choose um, at this point to administer activated charcoal during a lavage once at the start and once at the end. So that's the that's a bit of how to with our gastric lavage. Uh, then moving on to activated charcoal, uh, it's known as a universal antidote uh, because it's uh, an absorbent for uh, quite a lot of different in, uh, toxicants. Um, so the goal is to, for it to bind to, uh, to our poisons and then for it to be excreted. So that minimizes how much of the poison uh, gets absorbed by the patient. Activated charcoal is really effective because it has a large surface area. So one gram of activated charcoal has a surface area of about a thousand square meters, which is about the size of four tennis courts. As with other procedures, the earlier it is administered, the more effective it is. And as with other procedures, we should be aware of the contraindications. So this is a list of uh, reasons why you would um, uh, be cautious when, um, when thinking about using activated charcoal. Uh, the reasons are fairly similar to inducing vomiting. So in cases where there's a risk of uh, aspiration, you want to be quite uh, careful as well. Um, it's also good to know that there are things that uh, charcoal is ineffective in binding. So things like uh, petrol, uh, alcohols, ethanol, ethylene glycol, xylitol. Uh, so things that um, coincidentally uh, rhyme with uh, charcoal. Caustic um, <laughs> and corrosive substances don't quite fall on that list, uh, but also not so effective um, in those cases. Uh, you also want to um, be aware of using charcoal in cases where there's a risk of ulceration. It can delay ulcer healing, uh, risk of uh, gastrointestinal perforation. So if it perforates, then the charcoal can contaminate uh, the abdomen. And uh, it makes it really difficult to perform endoscopy if you've given the animal charcoal, everything looks black. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is uh, just a, a few notes on the on the dose. Um, generally speaking, we want to give it uh, mixed in food. Um, if you're going to give it um, as a liquid um, via a syringe, just do it very carefully. Um, aspiration is a risk. Um, adverse effects of charcoal include vomiting and dehydration, constipation. Hyphenatremia is an uncommon complication. Uh, the risk is increased uh, when you're giving it to small patients or if they're dehydrated for whatever reason, or if you're giving it in multiple doses. So situations where you want to repeat dosing of activated charcoal. Um, so that's if the poison undergoes uh, extensive enterohepatic recirculation. Um, if the toxicant has a long half-life, um, and you also want to give the repeated doses uh, repeated dosing at half the initial dose. Uh, generally give it every four to eight hours and you can give it over two to three days. Uh, with the initial dose, you wanna combine it with a cathartic just to move things along, but with repeated doses, um, don't use cathartics. So we've, um, we've gone over um, our ocular decontamination uh, technique. Uh, just a quick mention as well would be uh, topical uh, decontamination. Um, just remember to use uh, uh, PPE when we're uh, decontaminating substances that, uh, that can be damaging to skin. Uh, in long haired patients, uh, clipping them up first would make it easier. Um, use uh, tepid water, um, so warm, uh, warm water, not cold water, otherwise you could cause uh, hypothermia. Uh, hypothermia. Uh, in cases where you get um, uh, acids or, or bases or anything that's really corrosive, uh, beware of using high pressure sprays and don't scrub. Uh, dry toxicants are more easily removed by brushing or vacuuming um, and don't try to neutralize acids with bases and vice versa. Okay. Um, so enemas, um, I'll mention quickly that enemas are useful in cases where the pet has eaten toxic plants. So things like uh, Brinsfelsia and uh, it's also useful in cases where they've eaten snail bait. Without an enema, these toxins can linger in the colon where they can continue to be absorbed. Uh, when administering an enema, use warm water uh, to minimize, again, the risk of hypothermia. Uh, so when you get things like um, acids and alkalis, uh, so where you get cases where you can't, um, you don't really want to induce vomiting or perform gastric lavages, uh, dilution by giving the patient a drink of water or milk uh, can be helpful. 
And then um, this here is just for uh, completeness. Uh, so you can remove uh, things physically via endoscopy on a Friday night um, or gastrotomy. Uh, so they can be helpful, quite helpful for things um, in cases where they've uh, eaten batteries, especially if they've punctured the battery. All right. So now that we've, uh, we've done our telephone triage, we've assessed our patient, we've stabilized them, we've performed decontamination measures, we can talk about antidotes. The problem with antidotes is that there just aren't that many. So we might look at this list and think, cool, that's a good list of antidotes, but really the list of poisons are much longer. Um, and contrary to popular portrayals on TV, movies and books, most poisons don't have an antidote. Uh, so just this list here, uh, snake venom, we have snake antivenom, uh, ticks we're all familiar with, we've got antiserum, um, anticoagulant retentocytes, we've got vitamin K, opioids, we've got naloxone, benzos, we've got flumenazil, NSAIDs, we've got uh, misoprostol, organophosphates, we've got atropine, um, ethylene glycol, which we don't see very much of here in in Australia, we've got ethanol. Um, so I think my time is up. Uh, so I've just included this final slide here to remind us that supportive care is very important and is part of our management for the poisoned patients. Um, other steps that fit in around this point in time include performing further diagnostics and refining our history. So toxicology is a big topic and I'm at the end of my allotted 30 minutes. Uh, so that's it, thanks for listening. I saw that you said that you could use naloxone to reverse apomorphine. Yeah. I'm never like, is that because it is a morphine derivative? Yeah, so it, it belongs to the opioid class. So yeah, yeah it has, has some effect as well. So but if, if you get like a really sedated patient with like morphine, um, so you can reverse it. So metoclopamide is also? Uh, metoclopamide is good just to stop them from, from vomiting. So you can get the wrong vomiting if you don't get them. So the I thought metoclopamide was like a true reverse the aping morphine as opposed to like giving them a vomiting, which yeah. will just stop them from vomiting. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think Liz, yeah, Liz, um, Liz uh, uh, range, yeah, mentioned that the other day. Yeah, that was something that I wasn't aware of in general practice. I was actually giving um, Serenia. I never thought to use uh, Yeah, a bet yeah. that I worked with did that to me, and I was like, you know, that's like my cheap Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, because I think I wish it was a swan someday because I'm trying to prove a point and... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it is like the... Yeah. Sorry, not that. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think something really important in that is that we do have the antidotes, although there's very few for opioids and for non steroidal overdoses. So, just from a medical error point of view, is if you do accidentally administer more opioid than you intended, or you give a non steroidal and then someone else gives a non-steroidal because the you know, iPads aren't sinking, whatever. Like we just want you to be honest in those situations because we can actually do something about it. So don't run to the bathroom and cry, just come to someone, even if it's not the clinician involved and just tell someone because we can actually do something about it. Um, that's it. <laughs>